Uh, so I, I promise I won't be, I won't be too, too long uh, because uh, I've preached twice already today. Uh, so I've got bags in my eyes and sleep in my voice, uh, but the Lord is gracious and good. Amen? Uh, I sent, I sent uh, Pastor Ray a text message early this afternoon. I was like, hey, Pastor Ray, you know, praying for you, uh, praying for you and Robin, to which she responded, you know, hey, thank you for that. Uh, and it hit me, uh, and I'll, I'll try to say this without getting too, too emotional. Um, and I shared, I shared with him, I said, you know, this, this took you guys by surprise, uh, but it did not take our father by surprise. It did not. Uh, and if it didn't take him by surprise, then we need to be reminded that he is with you right now. He's passionate, he's caring, and he's loving towards you right now, and you need to hear that. And if you don't see that and feel that, you need to look to the empty tomb and what we're celebrating this weekend. That tells us that he cares and that he's with us. Um, and so I want that truth to obviously pour over the McKelveys, and I want it to pour over you all as the family of God here, because I think it's easy for us, especially, especially in the last couple of weeks, right? It's been really hard in Nashville. It's been, it's been super gross around here, and I think it's easy for us to see these things and get disheartened, but today, family, we look to an empty tomb, we are reminded that God is good, yes, that, that he's not falling asleep at the wheel, he is very aware of what's going on, and he is reminding us that he is still with us, and he loves us, and he's walking with us, and that's our hope. That's why we celebrate, right? That's why we can sing songs and, and put our hands up in celebration of a risen Savior because he is still sitting on the throne, amen? So in the same way that I told the church family earlier this morning that I'm up here, listen, I'm getting up here, right? In my emotions, I need y'all to, to catch up with me, okay? I'm tired, but that doesn't mean that y'all got to sleep on me, amen? All right? So we ready to do this thing? All right, I promise I won't be super long. I shouldn't promise that. Don't promise that, no. I'll be here until it's time for me to go. Uh, well, listen, we're going to be in Acts chapter 19 this evening. Uh, and as you're turning there, there was a book written over uh, about 140 years or so, 170 years, uh, by Herman Melville by the name of Moby Dick. Are you guys familiar with it? If you've never read it, spoiler alerts are coming your way. You had 170 years to read it, okay? So that's your fault, all right? So Herman Melville, he wrote this book, and it's a story about a man named Captain Ahab who had his leg uh, bitten off by this whale. And because of that, he wants revenge. And so for 40 years, he's chasing after this whale. He's going after him. He's in hot pursuit of this whale because he is bent on getting his revenge, right? And he's going after it, and, and eventually what happens is he actually catches up to this whale. He, he catches up to this whale, and, and uh, they, they meet up for about three days, and they're battling and battling and battling, and, and guess what? He ends up losing. He ends up losing, and what happens right before he loses, he throws this harpoon at Moby Dick, and he says this. He says, from hell's heart, I stab at thee. Really interesting, Right? He, he throws this harpoon, and it, it hits Moby Dick, and unbeknownst to him, there's this rope that's tied to this harpoon that wraps around him, and it drags him to his death, killing him and his entire crew. Family, I want to tell you today is that where we're headed, there's this reality for every single one of us that we have this same type of pursuit that Captain Ahab had, and it's kind of hellish. The same pursuit where we are chasing after something that drives us that we want for ourselves and we will do anything at any cost to have it. It's, it's kind of like this. Every single one of us, again, has this pursuit. There's something that you're stabbing at, and if you're not necessarily sure what that is, it's something along the lines of if you say, if only I could have, then I'd be blank. You know what I'm saying? If only I could graduate, then maybe I'd have a little bit more time to do the things that the church is asking me to do. If only I could marry, then I'd be happy. If I could have kids, then I would be complete. If only my spouse would be more intimate with me, then I wouldn't have to go look for it elsewhere. You get what I'm, what I'm saying? If, if only I had a little bit more money, then I would be content. You see, every single one of us, have the, we have these if-only moments where we're chasing after something and going after something, and that's just the tip of the spear, pun intended. But you see, almost every single one of our if-only statements are harpoons from hell's heart. 
Usually these things are well-intentioned, intended to address real hurt or real problems in our lives, but then we get settled on this one thing being the solution that we think is actually going to make us happy, and it becomes this obsession, an extreme focus that actually shuts other important things down in our lives and causes harm and destroys us and those that we love. Listen, what I want us to see today is that when you finally catch your if only moment, your if only whale that you've been hunting, it won't change a thing. Instead, you'll only hurt the people you've been dragging along with you and eventually you'll be dragged out to sea by the whale. Guys, today I want you to come face to face with this word that we say in the Christian church, idolatry. I wonder if we've come in here today with idols in our hearts. I want you to see that we have idols in our lives. I want you to show you not only that, but the reality of the beauty of Jesus Christ and how he actually addresses said idols in our lives. The fact that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus not only forgives us from our sins, but then calls us to kill these idols in our lives by replacing them with the passion that he gives that brings us back to life brings us to the reality where we're raised to new life. So are you ready? Let's do it. Acts chapter 19, starting at verse 11. He says this, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even face cloths or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. Did you catch what's happening here, right? Paul is is doing, he's moving around in Ephesus, and God is working in and through him, and there's these uh, these exorcists, if you will, the, the, the poltergeist gang. They're seeing what's happening. They're like, yo, we like what Paul is doing. We trying to get in on that. Right? And so, and so what do they do? They say, hey, we're going to cast out demons in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Not the Jesus that they preach or proclaim, but the one that that guy does. Don't you find that interesting? Right? And, and, and what happens? The, the evil spirit hits them with the Kiki Palmer, right? The evil spirit answered them saying, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul, but, but who are you? Kiki Palmer, you know that lady? She's, I, I don't know this man, Right? And, and what happens when the, this demon realizes, I don't know who this individual is. The man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them so that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. Family, I don't know if you've ever been in a fight, but if you got in that fight and you walked out with no pants on, you lost. <laughs> you took an L, okay? No question about it. Then he says this, when this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. Praise God. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. Essentially, something that took place in Ephesus was they had this, these, these spells and this magic and all these different things, their idol worship, and they said, you know what, hey, we're, we're done with this. And so they, they brought their Harry Potter books and their rock and roll albums and their hip-hop albums and threw them in the fire. You guys ever did that? Nope, just me? Cool. All right. And so they were like, yo, we're, we're turning to Jesus here in this moment. We we see that he's moving. We see that he's fantastic. We see that he's amazing. We are throwing this all away. So much so, keep on going. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Some commentaries say that that would equal up to about $7 million. It's a lot of money. That they're just like, we don't need this anymore. And we'll throw it away. They threw it away. And so what what happens here then is once this takes place, it got the attention of a a businessman by the name of Demetrius. He owned a a, a large chain of shops where they sold all these statues of of Artemis, who was their god there in the city, right? And, And he notices like, yo, we're about to lose out on a ton of money. Something's not right about this. We, we've got to do something about it. And so he gathers all the other businessmen and women together. Jump down to verse 25. He says this. When he had assembled them as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. 
You know that us selling these idols and, and people getting people involved in the worship of Artemis is how we make bank. And we're losing out on this money. He, he goes over and talks to Jerry and says, Jerry, if we're not careful, all the, these bumper stickers that you have, Artemis is my co-pilot, it's about to go away, right? He goes up to Bill and says, yo, yo, Bill, those shirts, Artemis is dope shirts that you just made, they're about to be gone. We, we got to do something about this, right? And so what, what takes place? Verse 26, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man, Paul, has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. That's the most duh statement that we're going to read in this text, right? Clearly, any god that you make with your hands ain't really a god, right? But can we, can we pause here for just two seconds? There are a lot of times where we recreate in our minds who and how God should be and how he should operate, right? That oftentimes what we're only doing is making projections of God to be little us, right? Y'all not picking up what I'm, what I'm putting down. Oftentimes, well, my, the God I worship isn't, won't act that way. He won't do that way. If, if you can create a God in your mind that isn't offensive and challenging you, then you are just creating a little you. All right, I'll digress. Y'all not ready for that. All right. Keep going, verse, verse 27. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess of Artemis, Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin. The very one all of Asia and the world worship. Demetrius essentially whips all these individuals into this big old frenzy. He, he gets them all together and he says, all right, guys, like we, we got to cause a scene. We are going to make sure that Paul and not only Paul, but all of Ephesus knows that Artemis is still God here, that, that, that she is still the ruler. And so the, the next couple of verses, they whip them up into this frenzy. It says about, about 25,000 people get together in this uh, amphitheater, 25,000 people. That's 5,000 more people than can fit in Bridgestone Arena, okay? It's a lot of people. And they get them all together, and they're all crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, right? So they're shouting this out. And then what's crazy is Paul wants to actually go into this amphitheater and talk to them about Jesus, right? And then his friends are like, you tripping. Why would you want to go in there? They're going to stone you, right? All, if you're not familiar with the, with the book of Acts, literally everywhere Paul goes, he gets beat up. He gets thrown in jail. He gets ridiculed, right? He gets spit on. He gets stoned. And they're like, yo, don't you learn? <laughs> Why would you want to go in there? No, no, we can't, we can't let you go in there, right? And so he doesn't. And then we get to verse 32. It says, some were shouting one thing and some another because the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. You had some people who were just there for the scene, right? And I'm here because my cousin and my cousin's brother told me to come. So, so this is why I'm here now. Right? And so they're like, all right, we're, we're, we're just here. And then finally, the crowd disperses. Paul and his friends live to see another day. Great narrative, right? What does that and Moby Dick have to do with the resurrection of Jesus? I'm glad that you asked. I want to tell you today, family, that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus gives us the ability to deny our idols and worship him. Okay? How? Well, first, we need to understand, and my, and my brother already said it, we all worship something. I, I need you all to understand this, okay? It, it, it's not an accident that he said it, and it was in my notes. We all worship something, okay? One of our generation's greatest influencers, uh, post and pre-slap, Will, is Will Smith, okay? Amen? The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? In his autobiography by the name of self-titled Will, he, he says that he's been interviewed and asked literally thousands of questions, but the best question that he's ever received was from his son, Trey, that asked him, Dad, who do you worship? And he says, of course, God, son. And then he says that the second greatest question that he was ever asked was also by his son, followed up that by saying, are you sure? Guys, I want to hit you with Trey Smith questions today. Who do you worship? And because we're here in church, the easy Christian answer is going to say, you know, God. And I'm going to ask you, are you sure? Are you sure? Family, we all worship something. 
I want to ask us this, this evening, what do you worship? Because the reality is we're worshiping something. In his book, You Are What You Love, James K.A. Smith says it this way, that you are what you love because you live towards what you want. He says earlier in that same chapter that to be human is to have a heart. You can't not love. So the question isn't whether you will love something as ultimate. The question is what you will love as ultimate. And you are what you love. The reality is every single one of us wants something, and those wants shape how we live and how we operate. The early church father, Augustine, said it this way, that wherever I'm carried, what? My love is carrying me. If that's true, then what is your love carrying you into this evening? What have you believed would actually give you joy and happiness and freedom, but in reality has only let you down? Most of us are going to read and hear this story in Acts chapter 19 and be like, well, we don't really relate to that, right? Of course, those, those first century people, they were, they were gullible. <laughs> they were bozos. A, 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 a silver statue, and you would get 20,000 people to just go crazy? No way. We wouldn't do that. Are we sure? Are we sure? Right? Just, just stop and think about the things that we chase after, the things that Demetrius says that we've created with our hands that we want and we go after, right? We're very similar. The reality is they are actually just a little bit more honest than, than we are. Again, every single one of us has our if-only moments, right? We're all chasing a whale, and we don't chase those things because we do the math, and we're like, oh, this makes sense, Right? That's, that's why we're going after it. No, our heart wants a God. It does. And so what we spend our time doing is finding these little gods to appease us. And that's why idols are so prevalent. Idols grab hold of our heart and then use your heart to convince your mind to keep on going on a whale hunt, even when it seems bananas, even when it doesn't make any sense. This is what's happening in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. They believe that Artemis promised them something, that she was their protector, that she was the prosperer of their city. And with her, they believe that they were guaranteed the security, this joy, this contentment. And if that's the case for them, family, what is that in your life? What is that for you today? Where do you think that if this was present in my life right now, I'll have power and joy? Is it influence? Is it success? Is it that relationship, beauty, money, romance, fame, having children? What is it? Every single one of us is chasing after something. And, and let me just say this. Those things aren't bad. Do you hear me? Are you here picking me? Those things aren't bad in and of themselves. The thing that makes them bad is when we've turned these good things into God things. They become the things that we believe will actually guarantee us some type of a uh, 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 preference or power, right? Martin Luther once said it this way, that whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that's really your God. We were created to worship something, and so often we run to the created things, more so than the creator. And we do that because idols, we think, will meet our needs. However, what we've come to realize is this. Number two, what we worship to find joy oftentimes brings us devastation. This is what I mean by that. What do we do with these idols? We fight to protect them, right? That's what we see happening in Acts chapter 19. When you threaten the idolatry of the people, the people get violent. The idols are their everything. They are the protectors of the city. What is that in your life? What's the protector of your city? What is the thing that the idea of losing it or never gaining it makes you despair? What is that thing that maybe I've mentioned this evening that as I've mentioned it, you got a little bit angry at me. Because that, that will tell you, you got an idol right there. If you lose a good thing, you're sad, right? And you should be. But if you lose a thing that you've turned into a god, man, you despair. You lose your mind. Ironically, idolizing something ultimately keeps you from being able to enjoy it. Because then you've got to protect it. You've, you've worked so hard to get that thing, and now that you have it, you're like, yo, don't touch it. Don't, don't mess with it. Don't talk about it. You obsess over it. You wake up thinking about it, 
and you can't enjoy it because you depend on it. Then once you have your idol, you have to do everything that you can to protect it. Demetrius says, we need to protect Artemis. Isn't that weird? That the God actually needs protection? That's how you know it's no good for you to begin with. If you got to protect it, you don't need it. The protector is supposed to be protecting the servant. That's the thing about idols. You find yourself trying to protect them, and all it's going to do is bring devastation in your life. Have you seen it yet? Maybe you've experienced that in your own life. You see, there's these moments in the middle of your whale chase where you have uh, what I'll call a, a mirror moment. When you kind of kind of walking around, you go to the bathroom or something, and you look in the mirror, and you're like, yo, what am I doing? <laughs> what have I become? I, I didn't start off feeling this way, but man, what in the world? You see, Captain Ahab, in his story, he actually has a, a mirror moment. In fact, uh, his, his first mate, Starbuck, actually goes up to him, and they're having a conversation just a, a, a few days before they have this three-day battle with, with Moby Dick, and Ahab is talking to Starbuck, and, and before, you know, they, they, they get into this conversation, you know, he says, he's like, man, I miss my wife and kids, right? I miss my wife and kids. And he's having this conversation with Starbuck, and he says to him, you know, I miss my wife and kids, and Starbuck is like, bro, we can go home, <laughs> You realize that you've put a lot of effort into this thing, and we don't have to. Let's, man, let's just go home. 40 years without seeing our family, that's a long time. Let's go home. And Ahab's like, nah, we're going to keep on going after this whale. And what happened in that pursuit? It led to devastation. Compare that to what happens in the book of, uh, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 19 with the uh, ch people in Ephesus. They, they come to the reality of, of what just took place, right? They see Paul doing these miracles in the power and majesty of God, people getting healed from his handkerchief, <laughs> right? His hanky, you need this? Touch that, go ahead, right? They, they see that. They see the, the, the seven sons of Sceva get their hands, you know, laid on them and get beat up, and they're like, all right, that didn't happen to Paul when he did it, but it happened. Is there has to be something about this Jesus Paul is talking about. And immediately they're like, hey, mirror moment, we submit. Where's the fire pit? I don't need this. I need Jesus. What's that mirror moment for you, family? Have you had one yet? Maybe you're having one right now. The thing is you can choose to ignore it, or you can choose rightly. If you do not respond rightly, you're going to be devastated and dragged to sea. Why? Because idols promise joy, but will always deliver disappointment. So will you respond like Ahab and keep going, keep chasing, one more click, one more, I'll change tomorrow? Or will you get around the fire pit and start throwing things in the fire? You see, my hope is it's the latter for all of us. And it begins by looking at yourself and realizing that you got a problem to begin with. That, that maybe you've been chasing after something that has been very demonic, has been some sort of hellish pursuit. That when you begin to be honest with that, then you have an opportunity to look at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and see the empty tomb that Jesus had to come and actually save us from our hellish pursuits. That he had to come and rescue us to save us from ourselves. You were wondering how I was gonna get to Easter with this, right? Here we are, family. In the resurrection, del Jesus delivers joy and offers us a way to kill our idols. How do I know that? Verse 30. In verse 30, it says this, remember, although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia who were his friends sent word to him, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. Did you catch that, right? Why in the world that 
would Paul want to step into this angry mob knowing what was going to be coming his way? I think it's because he was thinking about Jesus who did the very same thing for him and who did the very same thing for us. That Jesus would willingly step into an angry mob and die for our sins. That he didn't just die, he sacrificed himself. He gave himself up for us. Jesus, though he didn't deserve it, was arrested by the angry mob, right? And, and remember, his friends tried to talk him out of it. Remember Peter having a conversation with him? You ain't got to die, Jesus. And he said, Satan, come on, get behind me. You can't distract me from the mission that God has for me. I've got to do this. I've got to do this, friend. Thank you, but no thank you. He gave himself up to be killed. The God of the universe, the son of God, the God that Paul preached in Acts chapter 17 as this sovereign over everything God chose to die from heaven's heart. Jesus descended and from hell's heart, family, we stabbed him. We, along the, with the angry crowd, shouted, crucify him. Why did they want to crucify Jesus? Because he was a threat to their religious and political power, their idol. And oftentimes, our idols are crying for us to not put up with Jesus. But on the cross, Jesus was becoming all our sin that our idolatry points to. Family, he was ripped apart for you and I. When the spear went into his side, it was a collective cry from everyone who has ever worshipped anything other than a holy and righteous God. We all cried from hell's heart, we stab at thee. But unlike our idols, this is a better God. In fact, though, his death that was caused by our sin, he didn't condemn us. Family, he forgave us. We stabbed at him, and instead of carrying us out to sea, he caught us and brought us back to shore. And, and, and he didn't just do it so that we could be made alive. Yes, he did that so we could also be made new. That our hearts of stone that want to pursue idols, he's now given us a heart to flesh of wanting to serve him. Then he resurrected. Because family, again, he wasn't just making us safe. He wasn't just making us alive. He was making us brand new. On the shores, Christ secured for us in his death. His resurrection is remaking every single one of us in one day, family. He is coming back, and he's going to fix everything that our idol worship has broken. He's going to reign as king. He's going to be sovereign over the people he died to heal. Jesus is the only God that doesn't punish you when you fail him. Because guess what? He knew that you were going to fail. In fact, he died for our failures. He died to forgive us. And guess what? You and I can never let Jesus down because his whole reason for dying is because he already knew that we would. He's the only God that doesn't eventually drag you off to your death. He ushers you into rest. Family, what does that rest look like? I'm glad you asked. It means dying to yourself and being made alive in Jesus. This is why we celebrate uh, 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 this, this morning, actually, we had baptisms, right? I know you guys do baptisms here. But, but baptisms in the, in the church, right? It's a symbol. It's a picture of what's taking place on the inside here, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical representation of, hey, I, I know everything that Jesus has done for me. I'm, I'm dying to myself, and I'm being made alive in Christ Jesus. I'm being buried with him in my sin, but I'm being made alive in his life, that's why we do it. That's why we celebrate. Guys, following Jesus means death to self. That's why Jesus would say in Mark 8, 35, for whoever wants to save his life will have to lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel, he says, you'll save it. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense at all. And then he's like, you know what? It doesn't make any sense. Let me show you what I mean. He would then go and lose his life for us. That he would die for us. And then he says, now I've shown you what it means to stop chasing after idols 
I've given you an example of death. He shows us what obedience to God and death to self looks like. That's following the example of Jesus. That's why Paul could say in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I no longer live, but Christ in me. It's that little word there, with. With Christ. Listen, Jesus died so that we wouldn't have to. Yes, that's the gospel, but he died to show us how we can die as well. He died showing us what it means to be obedient to his father. So now we have an opportunity and the ability to say yes to him and no to ourselves. This is what I mean by that. Do you remember right before Jesus would be captured, he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was doing what? He was praying, right? Part of his prayer to his father was what? I don't want to die. If there's another opportunity, another way to, to bring about salvation, let's go that route. You want to know why? Because there's nothing attractive about death. There isn't. And so Jesus, who, who knew the plans of the Father, knew what he had to do, is still saying, yo, I'm okay if we don't have to go through this. But then he says, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus was obedient to the Father to the point of death. Death isn't attractive, guys. It never is. All this talk about death, right? But check this. We not only die to ourselves with Jesus, we are made alive in him as well. Paul will go on to tell us in Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite verses in all the scripture, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy. And I love that he's rich in mercy. It said, he didn't say, and God becoming rich in mercy. God thinking about being rich in mercy. God only being rich in mercy when you get some act right in your life. No, he says, this is just who he is. He's rich in mercy towards us. Why? Because of his great love that he had for us. What did he do, verse 5? Made us alive in the Messiah. Even though we are dead in our trespasses, we are saved by grace. Guys, when we come to the realization of the grace and mercy in our lives, when we have entered in the rested, resting in the beauty of the gospel, we are now made alive, which means we could, at one point, only choose idols, but now we have the ability to not choose idols. Because of Jesus, we can choose godliness. Because of Jesus, we can now choose intimacy with the Father. Because of Jesus, we now can be in right relationship with the Father. We have this ability now because the mercy and the grace of Jesus. Now, here's what I want to make clear at this moment. I'm, I'm landing the plane, I promise. Just because you can choose rightly doesn't mean that you always will. You get what I'm saying? Can I get like five people to be honest with me? Just because we can choose to be holy and blameless and, and choose righteousness doesn't mean we always will. Amen? Amen. I'm glad y'all honest, right? Because, because here's the thing. We live in this reality called the already not yet, right? This is what I mean by that. Already, once you have placed your faith in Jesus, you are already secured in Christ Jesus. That means that when you drop the ball, not if, but when you drop the ball, when you mess up, when you run back to an idol, God is not looking at you with condemnation. Why? Romans 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus, right? So if we are in those things already, God is looking at us and he is pleased. He's like, yo, these are my children. They be tripping. These are my children. Already, but not yet. Because even though there's no condemnation for us, family, we still be doing things that deserve us to be condemned. But that's the beauty of the gospel that's the beauty of reconciliation. That's the beauty of forgiveness, that every time I mess up, I have an opportunity to go back to the Father. You know, I remember when I was younger, I always used to be like, yo, why do I keep messing up? Why do I keep doing the same things that I said I wouldn't do? How, how am I still praying for these things years later? What's wrong with me? Man, it's only been in the last 
two years or so that I've come to realize that every time I mess up is another opportunity for me to embrace the gospel of Jesus. That every time I drop the ball, he's not looking at me frustrated. He's looking at me with his arms wide open saying, come home, son. Come get this forgiveness that's yours. Come get this grace that's yours. Come get this mercy that's waiting for you. I'm ready to pour it on you. And then when we're making our way to our father, just like the prodigal son, he's hiking up his pants and he's running towards us, ready to embrace us. I told y'all I'm up here. Get up here with me. This is the truth of Jesus. And we get excited about that. We love the reality of the gospel. It's ours because of an empty tomb. This already not yet. We have the ability not to be obedient or to be obedient, but that doesn't mean that we always will be. And the reason why is because idols look pleasant. They do. Idols will always seemingly give us immediate pleasure, immediate gratification. But the reality is, is they won't. But I need you to hear me say this. Idols will always win in a culture that demands immediate results. So that means that we, if, if, if we live in a culture that demands immediate results and we operate in that way, we need to begin to understand what it means to have this long, steady, bumpy road of obedience in following Jesus in one direction, right? We have to understand what true happiness is and that it isn't found in quick pleasure. We have to understand that true contentment is and what it is, and it's found in not a new item of, of clothes, but it's found in Jesus. We have to understand what true intimacy is, and it's, it, it isn't found in this transactional uh, 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 relationships that we have. There's something deep in realizing that the death and resurrection of Jesus allows us the chance to experience what our hearts really want. But there's a long journey ahead in realizing that, and Jesus is saying it's found in me. Jesus is saying, you want to live? You want to you follow me? You want satisfaction? You want contentment? You want joy? Come on in. But on your way in, don't forget to pick up your cross. It's got splinters on it. It might hurt a little bit, but I promise you it'll be worth it. I promise you it will be worth it. We chase after idols because they're so ever-present, but that is why Paul would say in Colossians chapter 1 that we have in Christ the hope of glory. Hope here is not wishful thinking. It's not some sort of I hope he comes through on what he said that he would do. No, this is a hope that is settled and unwavering because the same God that finished or started the work is going to be faithful to finish it. That he is going to be faithful to his promises to us. This hope that we have, this expectation of what's to come changes how we live now. What that means is this, our future hope of being in the presence of God fuels our current realities as followers of Jesus. Jesus isn't asking you today to sacrifice to get his attention. He's not asking you to throw your idols in the fire to make him happier, to prove how necessary it is for you to save him. He's asking you to look at him sacrificing for you, dying on a cross for you, harpoon jammed in his side for you, taking the just punishment for your treason against the one true God, and know that through it, he forgives you. He loves you, and that's not changing no matter what you do. And that should put us in a posture of rest. That should all, we should all collectively have this sigh of relief. Because you want to know why? We can, the challenge after all this is said and done is like, all right, all right, let's, let's get around the fire and actually throw our idols in, right? I think we got the fire starting here. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Figuratively. As we circle around the fire and, and throw our idols in, right, guess what we're going to be tempted to do? By Monday, we're going to be like, ah, I, I, still got some, I still got some needs of that. I, I still need that in my life. We'll find ourselves still chasing after these things, but God is patient with us. I'll, I'll close with this. This verse that keeps coming to my mind over and over over the last couple of weeks is, is this, that God's patience with us leads to our repentance. Man. 
Let that sink in. I feel like it's been coming to my mind because I'm in a stage right now with my kids where my patience is like this. I don't even know if you could really see through my finger how not patient I am with them right now. The littlest thing, I'd just be wanting to lose my mind. But then I'm hit with the Holy Spirit where he's like, he's like, yo, God is so patient with you. How many times are you dropping the ball that he's like, he'll, he'll get it. He'll figure it out. He'll come back to me. God is patient with us, loved ones. And the reason why that patience is established is because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and I. When we place our faith in that reality, place our faith in that truth, guys, it's a bumpy road ahead, but it's worth it. God is worth it. His his love towards us is worth it. So family, what do you need to burn this evening? What idol have you been holding on to that Jesus is saying, come and die and come live with me? That's my challenge for you tonight. Let me pray. Father, thank you again for this time. I thank you for my Christ for the Nations family and what they mean to me. I pray, God, in this moment, in this season that they're in, that you would continue to be kind to them. Father, would you be with, with the McKelveys? Do what you can do. Blow us away, showing us that you are listening for your glory and your glory alone, not to say, oh, well, we prayed hard for this. Nah, we want to see you move for your glory's sake. So, Father, would you heal? We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.